uh, we're, we're happy to have Startup Cafe here today at Enterprise Works and welcome back a former company that was here. It's always great when we have somebody who launched and we got to see them grow up and then leave the nest and go on to success. And they've remained in Champaign, which is a good story, but I think as I can tell from the title, he's going to tell you that not only did he spend uh, his career here at the University of Illinois as a faculty member and expert in hydrology, geology, and he also then decided he would launch a company here. But before he did that, he also was spending quite a bit of time teaching at Stanford. And all of us know that that's the de facto location for any startup uh, companies to choose. And many of our companies think they can only be successful if they should move out to the Bay Area. So when Craig came around here five or six years ago and said, I'm going to be spending some more time out in Silicon Valley living in Palo Alto, but when I come back, I'm going to do my company in Champaign. It was a great story and one that we were really excited to welcome into this building. They were here and grew their team and were just one of the nicest companies to work with, with people who gave back to others and were appreciative and we really miss having them here in our midst, but they've been in downtown Champaign and continue to have a great team and I think he's going to tell you um, how they've built their company culture and how he's become successful commercializing this technology. So please join me in welcoming Craig back here. All right, thank you, Laura. You did a really good job in fact. You <laughs> So this could get ugly. I've got the microphone and the advance and the laser pointer up on my desk. Really great to see all of you. I think about half of you I know well, and about half of you I, I haven't met. Uh, we assume that when we left Enterprise Works that, that the whole, <coughs> whole building would collapse without us. <laughs> That's not exactly the So um, our company is Aqueous Solutions. And we did indeed start right up there in room 26. Uh, our primary product is the software package called the Geochemist Workbench. And the Geochemist Workbench is a, a collection of software tools for solving problems in environmental chemistry. We have, as of last December, licensed our software in 66 countries around the world. There are over 3,000 installations of it. Uh, everyone asked how I got started in multi-component chemistry, and it was actually pretty long ago. Is that really? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that is the computer I worked on. <laughs> so when I was an undergraduate, I, uh, I sort of ran out of money and went to uh, work at Penn State, and they. Uh, one day my boss came to me and he said, as you could only say in the 1970s, go teach the computer to make EHPH diagrams. So at that time, teaching the computer to make EHPH diagrams involved typing out code on punch cards and carrying their punch cards across campus, slipped on the ice and they all fell and you would spend that about a week putting them back in the right order giving them to the computer groups, to the uh, computer operator, and he'd look at them, decide whether it might be worth putting them through the computer. If in fact you made a stupid mistake, you were in big trouble because he would look at your printout and scold you because you were wasting the computer cycles. So an IBM 370 was a really big deal. It was a huge computer. Um, Economists calculated that if we had a couple hundred of them, they would satisfy the rules demand for computing, and another computer would never have to be made. In 1977, an IBM 370 was about half of a mix. Five years later, the 286 chip came out. And this is obviously before most of you were born. That was faster. So we had at this university 35,000 people sharing half of the 286 chip. For comparison, the laptop that I'm uh, projecting this from, I just looked up, the CPU came out in 2014 and is approximately 10 million pounds faster. So I graduated a little bit late, a few problems along the way. 
But knowing something about multi-component chemistry may be pretty much in demand. Because multi-component chemistry before this point in time was a theoretical construct of no real application. And once computers came along, it started to become obvious that there were applications. And so I got hired by Exxon Production Research Company in Houston uh, as an undergrad. And that was an amazing experience. I worked first on a 370, but then they got an Amdahl supercomputer, and then a Cray-1, and a Cray-XMP, and a Cray-2. And so I was working literally on the fastest computers in the world. But everyone I worked with had a PhD, so I figured I'd better go back to school. I came to Illinois in 1982 as a graduate student with a bachelor's degree. Two years later, I was on the faculty. <laughs> it was a little bit of a sudden transition. Um, I worked at the university for three years. Um, most notable <coughs> were the sabbaticals I took. In 1990, I went to a cold in uh, Fontainebleau, France. And that was where I put together a bunch of little programs I had to make the first year of chemist workbench. And I went back there three years later and wrote a book on the reaction model. The first time we went there, our son Henry was conceived. The second time we went, our daughter Gabrielle was conceived. <laughs> so then we got pregnant with Claire, and people said, we didn't know you were in France. <laughs> All right, 2005, I went to the University of Western Australia and uh, wrote a great big standard version of the book that brought in a lot of biology. And as Laura said, in 2010, I went off theoretically for a year to Stanford University. And as you can see, I have good taste in sabbatical. <laughs> so everyone says that at Stanford, the venture capitalists walk the halls in the projects, and I never saw that but they do have very extensive numbers. And almost immediately started to get tied into this venture capital startup network. And I worked on some nice projects. I, I taught some courses. I ended up staying there as what's called a consulting professor for four years. When we first got there, we rented a house in Barron Park. And it was about a three mile bicycle ride to my building at campus, nice straight shot past Hugh Packer's headquarters, Facebook's headquarters. One of the great things about Silicon Valley is that you can typically bicycle someplace faster than you can drive. Then a year later, we rented a, another house out toward the Google Plex. So when I <coughs> rode to work, I went right past downtown Palo Alto. Downtown Palo Alto, well, there are about 170 unicorns in Silicon Valley. And I think about half of them are in downtown Palo Alto. It's actually a, a big problem because they have bought up all the storefronts. And the businesses, restaurants, and shops used to be there uh, have been displaced. Then we moved to <coughs> another house that was literally across the street from Tesla and VMware and the Park Research Lab. Right here is Gun High School. So the first year we moved out there, our daughter Gabrielle was going to be a freshman in high school. And so after we'd been there a couple of weeks, we went back to school night. And I very quickly realized that we were not in Kansas anymore. So we met her first teacher, an English teacher, and her English teacher, freshman English teacher, was undergraduate Harvard, PhD, Stanford. And I said, sure, but who published your, your thesis? <laughs> then we went and we sat out under the redwood trees in a little bowl that the principal got up, and the president of the PIE, which is Silicon Valley State for PTA, came up and presented a check for $640,000. That was their summer fundraiser. <laughs> I said, that was one heck of a base. <laughs> What I didn't know is that summer is not the big fundraising season for the PIE. And in fact, during the semester, the checks are more like $5 million. So then the principal gave a very heartwarming speech about diversity at Dunn High School, which turns out to be 60% white, 40% Asian. 
and almost no one else. And we went out. So Gun High School has an extraordinarily nice swimming pool, and that was great because Gabrielle loves to swim. She's an extraordinarily good swimmer. And the coach <laughs> at Gun High School is named Mark Hernandez. Mark has a lot of energy. <laughs> so he teaches in most of the school, and he coaches swimming, and he coaches water polo, and he has two young kids. Oh, yeah, I forgot, he's a law student full time. Standard. So Mark was a great influence. Uh, Gabrielle swam under Mark for a couple years and then she went and swam under part time but mostly at a, at a club where she got a very high level person. And what I remember about Mark is senior night. So after four years swimming in Palo Alto, we went to senior night and, and Mark made a speech about the department of senior and he talked an embarrassingly long amount of time about Gabrielle, and specifically about her Midwestern values. And that was true. Gabrielle just came to the pool and worked. And everyone else was, hey, look at me, look at me, but Gabrielle just swam. And I think that <clears throat> that really is a big difference between the Midwest and the Midwest. And then he went on to talk about how all the underclassmen view Gabrielle as their role model. And I started to think, you know, this is a high school in which kids drive Maseratis in class, where kids had their first startup when they were 10 and made their first million in middle school. And here they were using a Midwestern girl, a Midwestern young woman who came to school and worked hard and went to practice and worked hard and went home as the role model. And I began to think, what are the role models? So what are the role models? The role models are really, really, really rich people. So this is Larry Page, <coughs> Sergey Brin, and Eric Schmidt. And among them, they own eight jets. Many of them are park at Moffett Field. They're the only private citizens in the world who park their jets on U.S. Air Force bases. This is their 757. It's important to have a 757 in case you want to take a couple hundred of your friends to dinner in say Tokyo. And this is their fighter jet. It's really important to have a fighter jet because, um, because the fighter <laughs> But you have to admit, it's a great pickup. <laughs> so there are 53 billionaires in Palo Alto in the surrounding community. That's a lot. And the result of that is that Palo Alto is really, really expensive. So I just looked this up this morning. This is a nondescript spec house that someone built in Palo Alto in a not sort of narrow nice neighborhood. It has the obligatory bad addition on the front. Okay, it's for rent. That's a big deal when houses for rent from Palo Alto. It's really hard to find a house for rent. It's for rent for $10,000 a month. Now you may say that's overpriced, but it's not. People will apply and they will write essays about why this house should be rented to them and not to someone else. Yeah, a house that you wouldn't spend the night in in Palo Alto is worth a good $2 million. Yeah. Invested with rats and cockroaches. Okay. The third house that we stayed in, maybe three houses down was a vacant lot. And that went on the market for $15 million. Just a lot. The net result of this is that when you think you're pretty hot stuff and you've graduated with a master's degree in computer engineering and you get hired in Palo Alto with a starting salary of almost a quarter million dollars, you don't have a hope in the world of living in Palo Alto. A realtor will literally laugh at you. Right? If you were to rent, then most of your after-tax income would be off going to rent. So what you do is you live somewhere else. Most tech workers live in the city, in San Francisco. 
and they come in fleets of buses to work every day. It's about an hour and 15 minutes. The company stop, we provide internet in the buses so you can work while you're coming and going to work, because after all, that's a big part of your life, two and a half hours a day. You throw your laundry in the bottom of the bus because your company does your laundry for you. Your company gives you all your meals, gives you beers, gives you pecan tables, massages if you're getting a little bit tense. And that sounds pretty good, but let me tell you that all of those things show up on your W-2. <laughs> you pretty much have to take advantage of them because you're being taxed on them. So, obviously, almost no one who lives in Palo Alto, I mean, who works in Palo Alto, can live in Palo Alto. The great majority of people, almost everyone you meet over the course of the day comes from somewhere else. And that means that the traffic in Palo Alto is almost beyond description. I've been to Manila, Manila is worse, but not by that much. All the gardeners, all the housekeepers, all the construction workers, and let me tell you that every third house in Palo Alto is under construction. Everyone you meet in the store, everyone who cooks food for you, everyone who waits at the table, drives from somewhere else. And somewhere else starts at an hour and 15 minutes away and extends about two hours away. Many people in Palo Alto spend four hours a day commuting if there's not traffic jam, if there's not an accident. Said, there we go. All right, so when I got to Stanford, everyone at Stanford talks about startups. And everyone wants to have a unicorn. Obviously, a unicorn is, is a company with market valuation of $2 dollars. So I thought about everything that I heard every day at Stanford and came up with a recipe for you. So what you need to do is you need to start off with a good idea. Whatever you do, do not call your good idea a good idea. Because it's not. It's a disruptive technology. <laughs> then you get accepted in an incubator. This is very competitive. If you get accepted at a top level incubator, like Y Combinator, you have a 7% chance of being around in the US. You're under a lot of pressure to get the first version of your product out the door. The buzzword is quality comes later. Just get that product out and don't worry about how good it is. And then you try to pitch to a VC your first round of funding. You have to worry about stock classes, stock options, which you can sell and come back to bite you. Getting a stock option is not necessarily a good thing because they're taxable at the time in which you receive it, not the time in which you exercise it. A lot of people went bankrupt about 2000 because they had a million dollars in stock options that were worthless and then less than the taxable. Okay, then of course you have to put the companies in constant company, right? You're not successful because the staff's bad, you a new staff, you get a second round of funding, give it again, place the management because that's the problem, <coughs> push out the entrepreneurs because they have a problem, go through a period of explosive growth, pivot back to the original idea, I mean, we disrupted technology, <laughs> push up the market valuation, and then get out while the getting's good because as we all know, in Silicon Valley, the TV show that proved that no matter how hard you try, it is impossible to parody the actual Silicon Valley. <laughs> we all know from watching TV, the product, the end product, is not what you make, it's the value of the stock of the company. So, tech workers. There's an army of tech workers in Silicon Valley, very highly paid. There's a constant argument about whether tech workers are a commodity or not. It doesn't really matter whether they're a commodity or not. But they're hired and grows and they're fired and grows. The company changes its mind, pivots, you come to work and you have a letter thanking you for services and tradition is you get cut paid. It's always struck me as a little bit. And they don't fire you. They don't let you go, they don't make you redundant. 
you graduate. <laughs> and it's not that big a problem because someone else is going to hire you. But if you think about it, if there's no employer loyalty, then pretty much by definition there's no employee loyalty. And that's exactly the situation. Now that <clears throat> kind of scenario might play out really well for the first couple of years or a couple of years. But at some point, you're going to need institutional knowledge. At some point, you're going to need a product with substance to people back. And everyone has left because another company was offering $50,000 more for some of the work than <coughs> in that area. Uh, then your company's not going to be worth that much. All right, so I made a little cheat sheet here. And this is the difference between a unicorn and a mega million thing. So, both of them have the potential of paying off of hundreds of millions of dollars. Both of them are extremely unlikely to be realized. I just read that the probability of a pitch to a VC becoming a unicorn is now one in five million. Yeah, that's a pretty small number. The cost for a unicorn is years of your life, family, friends, sleep, sanity, your moral compass. And a moral compass is a little bit of a joke in Silicon Valley, or a private joke among my friends. Um, because in Palo Alto, Camino Real runs east west. It connects San Jose and California to San Francisco. But because it runs up and down in California, everyone agreed that Palo is the No, you see? It doesn't look on a map, it runs east west. It's the peninsula is almost at a 45 degree angle. El Camino Real comes up through San Jose and then goes west and goes north. So everyone in Palo Alto, you grew up there. I know that. <laughs> so we, we call West virtual north because if you tell someone to go north, they're going to go up the line. So anyway, that's the north. <laughs> <laughs> that's the north. Right. So the cost, that's the cost of the unicorn. The cost of a mega million is going to be $1. Well. <laughs> so, continue with something of interest. Me. Uh, <laughs> 2012, I retired from the University of Illinois in Y, I'm pretty much as I could, and I went and sat on the beach. Actually, I didn't do that. Kind of sounds good. We came here up in room 226, as I said, and um, four of us started a company. Uh, these are all people who have been working with me for a while. They're all here today except Dan, who decided not to come. <laughs> so, uh, uh, people who really helped us out were the Loros, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Jed Taylor. So, for about three years, I flew back and forth between Enterprise Works and Palo Alto. I estimate that I made 75 round trips. 300 flight legs, and uh, that was pretty much excruciating. I will say, one thing I learned is that first of all, once you start flying at 120,000 miles a year, they And second of all, there are a whole lot of successful people on airplanes, and they're all in the front of the airplane. And I learned a lot talking to these people. So one person I sat next to was a successful author, her um, husband had been president of Barclays in London. He, uh, up until a week earlier, had been president of Wells Fargo Wealth Management. They own 17 acres in Sand Hill Road, which is the most expensive commercial real estate in the world. They lived in Paris, they lived in London, they lived in New York, and they lived in Silicon Valley, and they lived in Chicago. And they were moving to Chicago because they wanted to live in a real city. Up. Now, admittedly, their real city in Chicago was, was buying up a whole floor of condos and building up on the pier and making it to one condo. So, but 
People think San Francisco is a great city. The little bit of secret about San Francisco is it's a mediocre city in a spectacular location. Oh, so anyhow, um, I sat back next to a lot of smart people up front, a lot of venture capitalists. Um, one that really gave me good advice was one of the first employees at Salesforce. And I told him about my company. Do you do is you wait for like three bucks and don't buy it and don't take anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, and uh, he had another company that he thought was a lot like ours. And it made uh, software for tracking objects and space, comments and satellites and so on. And uh, this company had come to Salesforce because they had plateaued. And what Salesforce did was we engineered the company as a premium company where they put out their base level software for free and then sold out. And so we kicked this around for a while, and Laura, our fears helped us a little bit. And we did something very similar. We decided to make a free student version of our software. And the free student version is, is full feature for our lowest level. And so far we have what, about 10,000 users around the world? It's being adopted very actively, a lot of geochemistry classes. Our idea is that today's users of our software will be our customers tomorrow. Uh, I think the first thing, the second year we are here, uh, we hired Illinois Business Consulting to work with us for a semester, and, and this is their group portrait. And they gave us all kinds of um, interesting advice. So one thing they really insisted on is that we start going to trade shows. And I was resistant to going to trade shows because what I saw is a whole lot of money in travel, a whole lot of money in preparing. We have some booths, some <clears throat> back in trade show, maybe a couple dozen people stop. This is going to seem worthwhile. Until we decided that instead of going to the trade show and sponsoring conference. And this was a big success. The first one we did was in, uh, in Sacramento, California. Here's a photo of the guys in their first thing. And, and we passed out green sunglasses. And uh, <coughs> last year, we sponsored the conference uh, in Prague. This year, in a few weeks, we sponsored the conference in Yokohama. You know, uh, when I called them up, they already had a platinum sponsor. And so they said, too late. And I said, well, what's more valuable than the platinum? So they talked to me about the dude that got the Palladian sponsor. <laughs> 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 yeah, pretty much everything that happens in the same time, it's all in the app. There's no yeah. negotiable. We also sponsor the student program that brings in students from third world countries to the conference. And they serve as aides. And so they all walk around. We have a couple hundred students walking around with our logo on the ship. All right, so back to Palo Alto. Um, fun games aside, there's a, there's a genuine dark side to Palo Alto. And it's centered in many ways around the Caltrain. So this is the Caltrain. It zips up and down the peninsula. It goes very quickly. And a large number of students have stepped in front of it. <clears throat> when we first went there, there was a big cluster of student suicides. And as we were leaving, there was a big, big cluster. Um, there was a lot of hand wringing, obviously, in the community about why this is happening. Initially, it just seemed to us like it was pushing parents. And then there's a, a racist flip side to that, which is uh, tiger wars. But actually, that really didn't turn out to be the case. And um, by all accounts, most parents aren't overtly pushing. The problem is the community. Just, well, the best explanation I read was a student at Alley. She said, when anything is possible, everything is expected. Another way to think about that is, is in this community, it's virtually impossible to be successful. There's a famous venture capitalist, and he was taking information from his watch company and selling the hedge funds. He got arrested. He was worth $500 million. And his explanation was, in Palo Alto, you're not 
anyone to make your first move. So um, the problem is, is pretty acute. The overall, the teen suicide get the most attention, but the overall suicide rate in Palo Alto is five times the national average. The CDC is now investigating this as an illness, as an epidemic of suicide. And it starts close to home. About a year ago, the best friend of one of my former colleagues at the university killed herself. She was a successful software engineer, probably in her 40s. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we saw that one of my daughter's friends, a National Merit Scholar, was going to Washington, she came back to Palo Alto and stepped her. So, it's now our last year in Palo Alto. My youngest daughter is the only freshman who makes the cheerleading squad. So we're pretty excited about that, and she was pretty excited about that. Um, but she was bullied so badly at this high school that toward the end of the year, she stopped going to school, and she stopped getting out of bed. And at this point, we said, it's time to go back to Kansas. So we moved back. We uh, <coughs> lived in the M2 building downtown, which we love. And then we graduated from Enterprise Works. You notice we graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and we are still waiting for our cupcake. <laughs> We would not get that. <laughs> we would just at least turn on this. So uh, we ended up moving offices down there as well. And uh, <laughs> we now I have eight number employees and, and uh, two interns working with us. Okay, so here's a recipe, another recipe. Great recipes. You might have a sane startup. First of all, are you going to be able to deliver value to your customers? Are your employees going to be engaged? Is that part of it? Is your family behind you? And are you going to be doing what you like? Do you want an exit strategy? Or are you going to be doing something that you enjoy doing the work? Something that really <laughs> makes it easy to get out of the morning. Then you have to make decisions. You can go with the heavy metal, you can bring in investors, there are lots of advantages to that, you get great advice from people who have been around for a long time, and you get money so you can grow rapidly. Okay. You also have another set of people you need to keep at it. Or you can try a lean startup, and in a lean startup, <coughs> what you do is you reinvest your profits and you reinvest your energy in growing your money. Okay. Neither one is best. We, uh, in large part because we, we already had a lot of software working before we came to Enterprise Works, decided to fund ourselves. So this is our uh, latest website. We've been through three website designs. A website is really your storefront in the 21st century. You need to keep it up to date and you need to keep it fresh. Um, Print ads. Print ads are expensive. And so this is a little bit like sponsoring conferences. We really couldn't afford print ads, but we could afford to pay more money to get cover for it, get the back cover of the main magazine in our field. And so now, <clears throat> every month, 28,000 people in our field get this magazine, and they throw it down on their desk, they either see the front cover or the back cover. We put some effort into making <coughs> our advertisements project positive images. We also hold workshops in the world. This is our chance to go out and first of all proselytize to teach you how to use our software and also to meet our customers. But we've taught a lot of them. Some of these clients taught on his own, some of them Ryan, Kate, and I have, have taught together. Um, this is one in uh, Sapporo, Japan. After the first day, we went out to the beer garden, the Sapporo beer garden, and uh, 
pretty much I buy a beer from her any day. <laughs> when you order a beer, they bring you this, this thing right here. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese are very good at drinking beer. Interestingly, in Japan, if you have even one drink, you simply go dry. And interesting, oops, interestingly, in <coughs> Japan, if you call a taxi, they will, at your request, bring an extra driver. The extra driver will drive your car. So when you wake up in the morning, your car is there, and you have to drive in the DUI. This is our, our workshop in uh, Prague. The one in Yokohama is, um, we have, have about 50 people signed up for it. Um, at any given time, we have at least a half dozen workshops uh, on the agenda of the web page. And we've just come out with a uh, product that we think is revolutionary. This is a software object that you can use to make reactive transport models of just about anything. It's a self linking software object. So drainage basins or estuaries or water treatment plants and bridge and movement kits. So it's going to take a while for that <coughs> to be accepted. This is a very new idea. We think this is the future of the kind of model. All right, so Silicon Valley. Here are the take home points. Silicon Valley is a great place to chase unicorns. Chasing unicorns is silly. And if you're going to start a company, consider <coughs> producing lasting values for your customers, your employees, and yourself. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you all very much for coming.